Welcome to episode 108 of the Hard Truth About B2B E-Commerce. I'm your co-host Isaiah Bollinger, and I'm I'm back with Tim. I think I missed an episode, you missed an episode, but we're we're back. We're back to normal, right, Tim? <laughs> we're back and better than ever. And uh, you know, once in a while, as our listeners know, we'll do uh, do it on our own. So I did that last week, but it always feels like this uh, this giant gap. I mean, you know, it's a we're so used to doing about the last, maybe a hundred out of the hundred eight episodes together. So it's kind of funny. It's kind yeah. of funny to do that. Well, it's nice to be able to have that flexibility, right? You know, we can't always be there every time. So. Exactly. So a couple things. Uh, I always have uh, a, a few shout outs. Uh, so uh, I convinced uh, a few more people to listen to uh, the <laughs> podcast to try it out. I, I asked some folks to do that. Screw uh, guerrilla marketing, right? You know, forcing your friends to listen to the podcast, right? You know, <laughs> and, and some of these folks I have mentioned before, but one of the things I think is really great is that uh, they're continuing to listen or they're coming back and they're they're finding um, episodes that really are resonating for them. And now that we have so many, uh, I think that that's possible for a lot of people who work, uh, you know, in e-commerce or, you know, just related areas even, because we do cover a lot of different things. But um, uh, so Betsy Emery Martin, who I've worked with uh, in many businesses uh, over the years, uh, she is a listener, Joe Lewandowski, uh, who is somebody I've been working with relatively recently. Uh, also, uh, Ray Fabic. And uh, let me see, uh, there was one more person. Oh, my God. Uh, I'll have to remember him later. I, th- I didn't write him down, but I'll, I'll remember him later. But we're going to ins- we're going to pause just for a moment because I want to make sure we insert our sponsor mentions. And then I'm going to throw it to Isaiah to introduce our guests. So let me just pause for a quick moment here. Balance is a B2B e-commerce payment solution that works well for you and for your buyers. It offers a seamless one-click checkout for almost any payment method, including ACH, wire, checks, cards, even terms. It's used by leaders in B2B e-commerce, and it's as easy as buying a shirt from Amazon. Check them out at getbalance.com. Book a session and tell them what your needs are. They are the first dedicated payment platform for B2B e-commerce, 100% tailored to your needs. Thanks again to our sponsor, Balance. Isaiah, who is our wonderful guest today? Yeah, I'm excited to introduce Jason Somerville, a managing partner at uh, GW Partners uh, or founding partner. I'm not sure which which you go by, but... Uh, Thanks, One of the, the the main people at at at, uh, at GW Partners. So tell us a little bit about what GW Partners is, and also the background of how you kind of got there. So before you, I gotta say your Somerville last name. I don't know. We're in Boston, so we uh, yep. Somerville. So it kind of throws me off. I'm like, uh, I obviously I always just think of the city, not the not the name. I'm sure you've, I don't know if you've got that before. <laughs> I have, yeah, and it's usually from from folks from Boston. Um, there is a new there is a New Jersey Somerville spelled there similar. Is. I think the same too. So those are the two that we get, which is you know funny because um, you know anytime I say my last name to someone, you know they're automatically going to want to spell it like the season. So so yeah, so whenever you see it, that S O M, it kind of draws the eye. So so yeah, I think everyone from from the Boston area, were like wait a minute, you know. Are you somehow, you know, did all your people come from Somerville, Mass? I'm like, no, sorry, I can't, <laughs> can't claim it, can't do it. Um, but yeah, thanks guys for for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, very quickly, G- GW Partners. You know, we are a essentially an investment banking and consulting um, firm that you know helps mostly founder owned businesses um, in you know kind of their path to growing their companies, and then ultimately, typically exiting or executing a strategic partnership type transaction. So, you know, people mostly in the consumer products world um, is, you know, who we focus on. Uh, They'll come to us and say, hey, you know, I have a I have a general goal of in the next two years, I want to try and grow my company and develop it into the best possible business it can be. And then I'd like to, you know, either bring on a highly strategic equity partner, or I'd like to exit all together. 
And so, you know, I want you guys to help me do that. So, you know, what, what gives us the right to, to be able to, to help people uh, in that journey? Um, you know, myself and my partner, Chris, between the two of us have really decades of kind of investment banking, operating, sales and marketing and, and entrepreneurial experience where, you know, we've exited our own businesses uh, multiple times and you kind of put all that in a pot and it gives us a, a lot of good, uh, good skills and experience where we can guide uh, founders uh, in particular through that type of journey. And you guys focus on e-commerce or brands that have generally an e-commerce component. So what, how did that, we do. it could be medical, I mean, it's, you're not doing, you know, services business. What got you guys? Is that just the background that you had or? No, no, it's interesting. And I, I blame Chris, my partner, <laughs> mostly for that, you know, and uh, especially on the on the hard days, I really blame Chris. So, um, but, you know, I, I actually, my career um, in investment banking began at the institutional level, working with all kinds of different companies, but big Fortune 500, you know, companies across a lot of sectors. Uh, and then when I became an entrepreneur after I left, you know, the, the corporate finance world, none of my businesses were e-commerce focused. However, when I met Chris, Chris's background was only in consumer. He had been actually consulting uh, with a lot of companies at the time uh, to actually help move their businesses more online, help access e-commerce channels, take their products. A lot of these companies were just traditionally selling into retail channels yeah. and, and moving them much more into e-commerce. Chris and I started talking, I started learning. And, you know, the good news was a lot of my skills were very, very applicable and transferable, regardless of business type. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Chris had some very specific expertise. So then, you know, we kind of got together and, and, you know, over the years, I've, I've learned now, you know, lots and lots of things about e-commerce in particular. And, you know, <laughs> I, I am much more of an expert than I was six years ago. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, Jason, a couple things. One is that I do know people with your last name. You know the singer Jimmy Somerville. You know, I, I don't know Jimmy Somerville. I'm surprised I don't. <laughs> he's, kind of, uh, he was like, like your third deal. cousin. <laughs> he was a big Maybe. deal, like in the '80s and, and into the '90s. Not so much a big deal now, but he was in a group that's called like the Communards, Bronski Beat, a different bunch of different groups. But he's okay. a very distinctive voice that. If you hear it, you might love it or you might hate it. But anyway, it has the name spelled the same way as your last name. So I wanted to. I always it. wondered why I was such a good singer. Now I know. You See, know. now you know. It's it's in the gene <laughs> that name. That's but, not uh, it. I'm I'm terrible. But <laughs> good to know somebody in the family tree is. Good. I'm I'm definitely going to look that up. <laughs> you you got to look it up. But uh, you know, more more on topic for for our listeners. I mean, there are, I think, a lot of the things that I find interesting, and I get in the weeds and a lot of you know, finance, finance related stuff, because I consult with sometimes smaller startups or businesses that are transforming or ones that are trying to exit. And also I've worked in the other direction as, as Isaiah knows, where it's the, uh, the funders, I always say founders and funders, like it's the funders yeah. who are saying, can you vet this for me? So I often get in the middle of that because I've been in e-commerce for so long and that They'll say, what is going on with this business or does this make sense or do you have any data on that or you know any people in this area? It's a fascinating kind of conduit that goes back and forth, you know, between founders and funders. And so I, it depends where you are in that spectrum. Do you kind of look at it the same way or is it, you know, do you look at I it? I do. Differently? Okay. And not only do I do that, it, it's particularly interesting in e-commerce because, you know, what you find is a lot of the funders have very traditional business backgrounds. There are a lot of B-school guys, yeah. a lot of people who have, you know, finance focused degrees. And but here's what's interesting about e-commerce. There has not ever been and there still is not really an e-commerce school. Right. You can't necessarily go to Harvard and get an MBA with a concentration in e-commerce. I expect at some point that will actually change. There and is I think a there program at Union College in Ohio in Cincinnati, Ohio, that is launching that I'm working on. OK, That's, very you, cool. You get a degree in e-commerce. It's going to be one of the first in the country. You can send your founders there. <laughs> there <you go. laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and so it's funny, it's this world of, of, you know, that it's a little bit murky for a lot of people with this, again, a very traditional type of background, especially investing background. So it's very common, you know, in those types of scenarios where those kinds of people are looking for others with this expertise, but where did they get the expertise? Like most of the time they got the expertise by just on the job training for the most part. They jumped into some part of the world. They learned it on their own. You know, they they, you know, got involved in masterminds or took online kind of courses and then just started trial and error. And then over the years kind of built a real experience and skill set. So it's especially interesting um, in this space when you see that uh, type of, of relationship. Because, yeah, those funders need guys like you to, to basically uh, to speak the language for them. Yeah. And, and uh, do you find that um, they struggle to, to understand all the financial modeling of e-commerce or, um, you know, we see it becoming more complex with multi-channel, right? That's part of why we started this podcast. Like, it's not just, you know, selling to consumers. You can sell to businesses online, maybe of EDI. You might also have marketplaces, you know, buy online, pick up in store, stores, and it becomes this like kind of spider web of different channels. Do you think that there's just a lack of expertise around that complexity? And that's, I mean, that's kind of what you guys are doing, right? That's why you guys, I think, yeah. specialize in this a little bit, you know? Um, well, I think, I think yes, because it's, it's just evolving and has been evolving so quickly. So a lot of times, you know, when it comes to just doing math or doing financial engineering, you know, that isn't the issue so much. It's, it's understanding the world as it's being expressed in data, right? And saying, well, not that there's too much data, but the data is in, in kind of the, the way we're getting data and, and the different types of ways to capture data and what to do with that data is evolving so much all the time that the thing that you knew a year ago, you can kind of throw it out the window, right? And so that's the other thing that it's keeping up with, even let's say something as simple, which the whole e-commerce world knows about when, you know, you had the issues with iOS changes for Facebook marketing, right? That's a very good example of how yeah. that one little event just changed all kinds of things about how to market, where do I get data, what data can I rely on, and, and ultimately, to, you know, boiling it down to the financial piece of it, it's a moving target. So I think that's the that's the difficult part. Yeah, and they're used to kind of a stable financial model, but it's almost like you can't rely on that because you got to be constantly innovating and keeping up with whatever the new trends are, which are changing daily, monthly. TikTok is right. now like the new hot thing. And so, and I think some, some folks, and I've seen some businesses that I don't think really adapted or progressed well from iOS 14, they're reliant on the old ways of Facebook marketing and they never were able to kind of like transition to what it is now, which is I think probably harder now it requires more creativity and, you know, <laughs> it's just harder. Now. Think, of, think about too. And I know you guys know this, that spawned this whole wave of new attribution software platforms. Yeah, right? Like before course. that, everyone was just using the Facebook in, so in play. Like I don't need, <laughs> I don't need triple whale. I got Facebook's play. I mean, triple whale wasn't even a thing yeah. or North beam or any of them. Yep. And it like, it just created this whole new industry of yeah. pixel data capture. So it's, and then who do you trust, stuff. right? You can get like one thing we see is like, you can get like 50 different, you know, ways of looking at the same data right and so everyone right. should juice the numbers and especially agencies i think do this too where they like give you the good view of what the numbers look like to make oh yeah good. <laughs> that's right well, you know, yeah. you brought up something really interesting as it because a lot of these i think it's kind of being ready for change is, is such a yeah. big thing and this is true on the finance side as much as it is on you know the e-commerce business owner side you know, I, I, since I'm an old guy and I've been doing this a really, really long time, you know, a lot of the early funders were people who were like in the catalog business or they were in the retail right. business or or uh, people who own call center, you know, uh, operations, you know, were investing in e-com because, it, you know, what it was like this small thing that was growing as opposed to the enormous thing that it is today. I mean, that's and now, you know you go all of these years and years later, it's a very different you know, thing. You have to think like, as he said, TikTok, but even TikTok is not 
new enough, right? I mean, there's yeah, so yeah, many it's not. The next, right? the next yeah. TikTok, right? And so, yeah, I think that's almost a better way of looking at it is like, you need to put yourself in a position to be able to like be super nimble and make very fast incremental changes. And I think most companies aren't really ready for that. And I think that's part of why we started this podcast around B2B and B2B commerce is B2B is, I think, slower to change in some cases they're resistant to get sales reps to like i you know we're dealing with a, a customer right now that's still kind of resisting the idea of a more modern b2b e-commerce experience and getting their sales reps using that to train their customers to buy online like they just they a lot of these companies just want their sales reps to be placing the orders but financially you know i'm, I'm actually curious to hear your answer like it it can't be a great business model for the long term to have your sales reps punching in orders in NetSuite. Like, no, you know, I mean, I think that it just, and so Let's I'm, just say no. <laughs> I'm curious what you see as, do you think it, we've had a couple people on the podcast say that potentially the finance side might be the main driver of this innovation in B2B commerce. Cause they all, they realize, Hey, wait a sec. Why am I paying my $300,000 a year sales rep to punch in orders like that makes no sense right when i need him going out like knocking on doors and or consulting with my big customers right and so is that something right. you're seeing coming from the financial side or even from you guys to kind of push your founders to hey why are we taking all these big orders over the phone when we could a hundred percent i mean you know i think a lot of the way we look at a company, we're kind of looking at it oftentimes through the eyes of a potential investor or an acquirer, right? So when we're looking at it, we say, well, what are all the ways that the company is inefficient right now where it could improve in those efficiencies? And the kinds of things that you're mentioning are, are you know, easy. That's kind of table stakes, right? It's like, look, if you're paying someone, a high paid employee who's doing essentially a more administrative type task, like, there's no world where that tends to make sense, right? But then to take that fact and then turn it into an execution plan, well, okay, well, what do I actually specifically do about that? That's where, you know, a lot of times things just either don't get prioritized or, you know, it's like, yeah, it's been on the whiteboard for two years. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> well, what what's the thing that's going to actually make it happen? And I think it's one of two. It's either the financial side, you know, looking at it and saying, hey, guys, we're leaving a ton of margin on the table by just being inefficient, or it's if you start losing market share to someone who's doing something you're not doing. Yeah. It's like one matter. of those two yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. So there'll be kind of two drivers, right? The financial, you know, efficiency requirements of automation and moving low value tasks online. And then the folks that are doing that and getting ahead of the curve are going to force the slow adopters to adopt because they're probably going to start winning market yeah. share and the customers are going to probably enjoy that experience and have that be able to log in, see their order statuses. But I think that to your point, the reason it's on the whiteboard and doesn't get done is because it is, it is fairly complicated, right? You're talking custom pricing, maybe with the ERP price, like, and, and Tim, we talk about this a lot, which is, should they get rid of the one-to-one -one pricing and go to like kind of a tiered pricing? But a lot of companies don't want to do that because they want, you know, their sales reps to be able to negotiate per deal. So I think a lot of it is just also it's overwhelming for companies to take on because they they're not necessarily technology savvy in in that way, or they're they're good at making a product and that's that's what they're good at, right? They make product, they don't yeah. build software, you know, or build software experiences, you know. Well, and I think, and, and, you know, a lot of these companies, they don't have a, like, there's not a CTO, like that's not a seat that yeah. someone has filled in. And, and so even just the idea of figuring out the tech stack, it just starts to become, you know, a little bit of a head spin. And again, if, if I think about the world of kind of small to medium size, you know, type businesses, right. Huh. There's not a CTO. They want to maybe build something out that, you know, is, is more than just a glorified order taking portal. It, they want it to be a legitimate experience for their B2B customers. Um, and then they start getting into this idea of, okay, well, what's the right tech stack? What's the right integrations? How are they going to work together? And it all comes back to that whole idea. It's like, you know, well, if it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. our, if we're, as long as we're doing okay and our revenue's good and our profits are okay, like, ah, why, you know, why yeah. bother? 
we're good. Right? And it's probably and then, a lot of risk for whoever, like, the, it might be the director of technology. Maybe he's not CTO, but he's really kind of like an IT guy that does the ERP. It's a lot right. of risk for him to push that because he does know it very well and he might fail in that project or the marketing person, same thing. Right. And so there's probably That's a right. fear that these guys are going to fail on the project. My, I, I'm, this is just a little bit of a, a guess on my part, but I think some of that's, that's happening. You know, I think the other thing with B2B that's um, a little different than B2C, I think, and I don't know, I'd love to hear your, your perspective on this is so it's more often, I think, in those types of interactions that at least in the beginning, there's kind of this relationship component, right? There's oftentimes this belief that, you know, okay, if I'm if I'm purchasing something, either let's say I'm just buying inventory or maybe I'm purchasing a service or a software or whatever for a company, whether I'm the owner or just someone that works there, it's much more common for that initial interaction to want to be with a human being that is now your sort of relationship person at this vendor slash supplier. And so it's that integration between the idea that is that a, is that really necessary or do we just think it, think it is because that's what we're used to. And then how do you take that? If it is necessary, preserve it, but then keep everything much more efficient and we'll call it, you know, modern, by having the ongoing experience be more digital, which is what more and more people who are actually interacting want to see, right? I mean, as, as you know, as things progress and, you know, as the population just ages and ages and ages, you know, over time, the percentage of people inside of companies interacting that is used to a digital experience and a lot of different things in their life just goes up and up and up. Right. So I that's like what they're used millennials to. Millennials you know? are like almost 40 years old. Like people forget that like, Oh, it's millennials. Are the, they're not that young. They're like, you know, yeah, right. I mean, exactly. The example that, uh, that I often use is, you know, I have a 92 year old on or all order solar groceries through Instacart. Right. I mean, so, you know, people don't realize how, how long the internet has been around and how familiar yeah. people have been, you know, she was in, before she retired, she had an email address and whatever, and she's 92. Right. So it's yeah. just kind of like, yeah, yeah my all step, these my step things have moved for, for decades. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but a couple things that you brought up that I think are interesting. I think that in the difference between B2B and B2C, again, which we dissect from a lot of different angles, but I think behaviorally, it's a question of what people were used to versus what they really want. And a lot mm -hmm. of the, a lot of the, the you know in real life interactions I've had with companies that have transformed, let's say, you know, they're bigger and they've gone through these processes, is that their big clients don't want to spend time interacting with a salesperson or a rep unnecessarily right see that's mm -hmm. the thing they want to have someone there or a name that they connect to or what have you if needed and so everything right. else that can be automated that their are monthly orders or monthly whatever they just want it automated and they're and they're done and they can do, go do their own thing so it's figuring out that balance it's like how do you still have someone when needed but then no one all the rest of the time because you don't need it. Yeah. I think that the problem is that most of these companies are not actually very sophisticated with how their sales organizations and functions work. And so I, you know, at Trellis and, and I've talked to a lot of people in sales world. So I think the, the better way to think about it is to break down the functions of sales and where they're needed. So, you know, I think that one, the first step is BDR or lead gen, right? But that's where the website is important, right? I think cold calling and knocking on doors. I mean, yeah, you can have that, but I don't think you should rely entirely on that. So you need marketing and e-commerce is probably the best way to market products, right? Because you can show all the visuals, you can have SEO through a large catalog, you know, especially if you're distribution, right? You might have a hundred thousand SKUs. You could rank number one for like a, maybe a niche mm -hmm. category that you have all the data. And so from a, from a lead gen perspective, which is sales, e-commerce should be one of your main focuses, right? Because it's the best way to market. That's actually how I got started because I was doing marketing in 2012 and I realized, well, all these companies, they want SEO, but you know, you're not going to get any SEO with 
five page content website, but you will, if you put a thousand products online, you have good product data, you know, social media, and you build this experience. Yeah. Right. So that's one function. Right. And I think e-commerce has to play a huge part in it, but humans can be part of it too. Right. Going after big accounts manually. So I think it's, there's definitely not an either or then I think you have account executives, right. Which is like the lead comes in, we need to qualify, we need to bring them in. I think some of that could be automated through the website, right? Some of the smaller, you know, five person company probably doesn't need a sophisticated quote. Maybe Lenovo does this really well. If you go to Lenovo, and I don't, it, it might've changed because it hasn't, it's been a while since I signed up. I, this is way back. I signed up as a Trellis account, got a Trellis discount as a company and was able to buy without talking to someone as a company. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think for small companies, that makes a lot of sense. Bigger companies maybe need to be onboarded by a sales rep and there's that account executive function. And then this is where I think there's the failure is that once they've been onboarded as a customer, then it's really account management. And I think companies don't understand account management is a certain sales skill set that's a little bit different than getting new business. And I would separate the two. So at Trellis, like there's overlap and, you know, we don't have a huge sales team, but we try to separate because going out and getting new business is just, it's not the same skill set as, I don't know, farming and growing existing accounts. And I think that's the failure of most B2B companies or the B2B functions within these companies is that they just lump it all into sales <laughs> or customer service. And it's like, there's just mm -hmm. more nuances than that. And I think that's where e-commerce is it can serve as part of that account management function. Cause you know, if I want to buy at 10 PM, I can't reach customer service or, you know, I can just log, I want to log in and buy maybe at 10 PM or like, I don't know if I'm a business owner or, you know, I, I, I see how my wife works. She works at midnight sometimes. I don't know how, like she's very, very nighttime person. Right. And maybe that you're a procurement person at a company and, you know, but, you could still have the account manager call her the next day after she places the order and say, Hey, just want to make sure you got everything you needed. Was this, you know, blah, 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 you know, kind of like massage it and try and make more money out of it. So I think that there's just a lack of sophistication in, 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 in sales in these organizations. And they're just operating like it's 1997 and we all go to the golf course and, have a beer and that's how like yes there's business done that way but mm -hmm. it's it is 2023 me and me and tim met on linkedin <laughs> right like that's, that's you know, like, and now you're doing a podcast together yeah, exactly yeah, like, and, now we have a podcast together. Together and, we're, and, and we have billions of dollars and hundreds <laughs> of millions of followers so i know that was a super long winded right. answer but i think that sales reps need to exist to some capacity but it's like an account manager should be compensated differently than the sales executives and the e-commerce should be supporting all, that whole process in a different ways. You way. are making a good point. I think yeah. that it's it's a question of how mature the company is, how big the company is, how, yeah. you know, all of these things. Because of course there are companies that do all of those right, things right. There are. But mm -hmm. I, I think that there is a lot of opportunity for what you're talking about here to kind of differentiate and make that all happen. I agree. Yeah. One thing that I think um, has yet to be fully embraced, kind of to your point, Isaiah, is I think what what a lot of B2B selling can learn from B2C is that, you know, B2C e-commerce, if you go in there, it's all about two things, right? It's about traffic and conversion, right? Yeah. And it's and, in, and within that, it's about removing points of friction. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of times, you know, these businesses, they understand what the points of friction are. Kind of from the old process and they feel like they've maybe addressed those but in the kind of new world there's all these other opportunities to remove those points of friction through digital because i almost say i, I kind of look at e i use e-commerce and digital commerce sort of interchangeably especially when we start thinking about a b2b type environment where yeah. hey how can i use you know the digital environment to remove friction and make my customer's life easy to work with me. That's what you want. Like you don't want you don't want to make their life hard. You don't want them to be like, oh man, I I want to buy a product from you, but you just make it so hard. I'm gonna go buy it from someone else. Yeah. Right. You don't you don't want any of that. And I think 
to your point, like that is where the opportunity is, where companies that are, are selling B2B can embrace the digital commerce world to, to really remove points of friction and to make customers' lives easier. And I think, you know, it feels like some combination and every business sector is different, but some combination of that ability to have, you know, in the beginning, that upfront kind of human maybe relationship but then once that's kind of established, quickly moving into a very digitized experience going forward feels like the right sort of model. Yeah. Um, but With I think it's management, it's, it's, right? It's, it's you can time. check up and you can have that relationship right. manager. But, you know, potentially you might want to have your account executives, which are often the most valuable, expensive salespeople going out getting new accounts and not, you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah you could probably lower your cost by having, you know, a different layer of account management deal with those, those customers who maybe are better at dealing with the website. They're trained on the website, things like that. You know, well, I think a, a couple things that our, our listeners have heard, you know, from, from other you know, companies that have been on are really point out what you're saying. It, it just mm -hmm. is that they, uh, you know, sometimes the ease is, is really just the most important thing to think about. Like what's easy. Mm -hmm what's easy for our, our customers what would they really want to happen quicker and you know in a, in a better way and and we've talked about how a lot of people want to just have you know they want to be able to do get transactions on their phone because that's what they have with them all the time right and sometimes they they can't and sometimes there's a roadblock and even just clearing that up is easy but the other thing i found fascinating is over the last few years especially started during the pandemic the dollar value of everything that happens, you know, through a, a digital easy ordering process for B2B has gone up, 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 you know, and right. people like places like Caterpillar, we've, Isaiah, you've probably heard the exact numbers as well. You know, there are customers spending millions with just like a click to buy, yeah. you know, like prove this They're order. really sophisticated. They have like an app. And they yeah. have like the tracking, so you can like register. It's, it's incredible. People never would have spent millions, you know, let's say seven, six, seven years ago in B2B just by tapping on their phone. And they will now. And I think mm -hmm. that that's something that these companies have to think about. It's like, you know what? If I trust the process and the security and everything else that you got to trust, then sure. you can make this happen because the model already exists. Do you, uh, Jason, do you see any... Um resistance when you know in your portfolio or over the years of your experience where you guys have gone in and it's like obvious maybe to bring some of the stuff online with the sales reps or there's some part of the organization that just doesn't want to change because they're like threatened that it's going to replace their job um because it seems like there's oh yeah there's definitely some of that going on um and we've had you know discussion about that on previous podcasts so i'm curious like just stories that you've had and how that's come up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, I mean, not, not that long ago, you know, we were working with somebody that to kind of completely overhaul their entire sales and marketing really function, right. How they, how they reach customers, who's involved in the organization and, yeah. you know, what are the right skill sets and, you know, and a lot of it, you know, really was about, you know, taking sort of an old style approach and, and modernizing it. And I think, look, of course, there's always going to be, um, you know, anytime you're making change, it's going to be potentially uncomfortable for people. They don't really, you will know, tend to deal well with it, most people. But I think the point really was, is to kind of show people how, like, wait a minute, this isn't a leaving you behind. This is a bringing you forward right type of situation where you know your role may be shifting a little bit um but in the end it's actually going to be better for you better for the company and better for customers so you know it, it takes and i think you know that's part of the reason you tend to see this stuff inside of companies just move a little bit slower right because i feel like Companies, a lot of times, just they move much slower than individual people move, right? So because they're a collective, essentially. And there's a lot of, you know, we'll call it motivations and potential roadblocks. But I see it, I'll tell you where I see it even more is just at the, um, just at the ownership level, because 
you know, to your point, yeah, Tim, you asked me about just kind of the, the finance piece of it. And, and it's really wanting to understand, like, how I, I need to know what the bottom line real effect of this is going to be, right? And if I can't get my arms around that, and it's a big change, I'm gonna just be hesitant to do it. And I think that's the that's the hardest part, right? It's it, and a lot of times you can do really good work and analysis and do a lot of good projecting, but you can't say for sure. Well, this is exactly how it's yeah. going to play out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's hard. To, you can't guarantee, especially with B two B. It's not like B two C where it's like, oh, if we just make the site faster, we'll have a little bit more conversions. In B two B, as we talked, it's almost like this tool for the sales function right and it's hard to quantify the value of that and that's why i think right. you don't have to believe in it and i think that's you know there are more and more people i think believing it just from seeing how it's working in other organizations and seeing that that's the future of where buying is going but like yeah mm -hmm. it's hard to put yeah. a model in paper that that's going to force you to believe it just but through a little yeah, what, what i would quickly yeah, I'll quickly add one thing to that. I think it's almost what I often find say, uh, I'm saying to people now is the negative. I'll say it in the negative. I'll say, look, if you don't do it, here's here's what will happen, right? Or if you if you don't do it, you see all these other people already have, or you don't do it. You know, it's it's almost easier sometimes to to say not like here are exactly what's going to happen by percents and dollars and you know savings and all of these sorts of things. But really, you know, what what do you expect to be happening with your business in five years if you don't do this? Right. It's, it's you know, it's it's really that sort of argument I now think because there's so many cases, you know. There's I think so that is cases. that is the risk, right? Is that it's going to help grow your business and definitely, you know, hopefully add profit to the business and revenue. But I think that equally as important is not doing it is a risk of you going out of business. Right. And so by not doing it, you know, saying, hey, you got to call me up and that's the only way to order email or the experience is, is second rate to, all, you know, 10 good competitors. You, know, like, you could go out of business. Right. Like that's a legitimate risk over time for these companies. I mean, you know, and again, this is sort of the benefit of having had a long career already. But, you know, one of my my first real business that I owned was a printing business, right? And then I ended up doing a lot of other things and being in tech and e-commerce and all this stuff. But I had a printing business. Would I start a printing business today and make any money out of it? Probably not, unless it were like a very special printing business. But, you know, that's that's sort of the way you have to look at things. I didn't sit there, you know, six, seven years in and say, wait a minute, should I continue exactly as I am? It's like, no, I didn't do that. I said, let's what's next, right? And that's that's how businesses need to think. You know, you can't just sit there and say, I'm doing exactly the same thing every year forever. You know. I think the other way we try to advise clients is to, is to think about this stuff strategically. So it's not really only about how can it improve your current processes and your current business, but how how can you build this into an asset that can be leveraged into bigger and better things overall, you know, can potentially open up new sure. avenues of business because you've now kind of invested in something that is allowing you to seize opportunities that you couldn't otherwise seize. I mean, I'll give you one example where, so there we're involved in a direct consumer lobster uh, company and, um, you know, we're working with a big food distributor, um, probably, I don't know, four or 500 million you know, level. And what those guys did was a while ago, they started their own e-commerce channel to kind of leverage their operations, leverage, you know, their other assets. And by, by sort of going through that process, it basically upgraded everything that they did. And the way they interact both, they, they're both B2C and B2B, but they run everything through the same tech stack. And so mm -hmm. it's all, so it, it, it kind of said, oh, wait a minute, we're gonna go this project and yes, it will help us with one channel, but it actually creates opportunities elsewhere. And I think that's another thing that a lot of times people aren't thinking about. They're, they're sitting there, they're focused on the particular, you know, what's in front of them. Uh, and not really understanding what possibilities uh, some of this can can open up.
um, by by doing that. A super important point. I think if you do B two B commerce right, you should have the infrastructure to sell on many channels really effectively, right? Because B two B commerce is generally more complex. So if you have the tech stack to do company accounts and company pricing, you know, it should be pretty easy to do consumer accounts and retail. So you can easily do retail. Usually once you have B2B, um, you can probably integrate with, you know, like a big commerce owns Feedonomics, which is a marketplace mm -hmm. education tool. So you can, sure. you know, uh, you know, things like Shopify make that easier and then these PIM systems make that easier. So you may need a PIM. So like you get these systems in place and now it's like you're set up to do marketplaces, to do B2B, to do B2C, maybe buy online mm -hmm. store and you can become like way more or drop shipping and add more to your, you know, some of it, is, can you add more to your catalog, right? Can you, you know, become more unique right. over time, right? Or even add a marketplace. That's another thing we're seeing is some people adding marketplaces. Yeah, There's for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, if we, if we think about, well, where is most of the innovation coming from? Like, where are the new kind of ways to reach customers coming from? Like, most of them are coming from the digital world, right? You know, not all, I mean, there are a lot of people focused on kind of that, like from a B2C standpoint, like in-store experience and, you know, a little more than just putting a bunch of products on a shelf. You know, they, when you come into their store now, they want it to be almost yeah, like an experience while you're also buying some products. But, you know, most of the innovation is coming, you know, digitally. So, you know, again, it's, it's hard to imagine you're going to go wrong by investing in your infrastructure and opening these channels. You're just going to be more ready to take advantage of innovation faster mm -hmm. than your competition because you did the upfront work, right? Yes. You're kind of ready to go. That's so important. Like, but so how do you, that's where I think it's that it's hard to explain that to people, right? To these founders that they, how do you put a dollar value? They just want to see, oh, I put $1, get $2 out. Right. And it's like, it's hard. That isn't necessarily that, right? It's almost this future asset. It's a hedge against the future, kind of, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, you have to have a vision, right? I mean, I think that not everybody can have a, a vision and sit back and say, okay, I can see it. I mean, you know, we that's the world we play in all the time. Like a big part of our job is to try to help develop that vision and then explain that vision. So if somebody is, you know, wanting to sell a company and, and we're out there talking to others about it. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is kind of the, the vision of the future, right? In fact, that's, that's a big, big part of it. The past is really just there to be used as evidence that this future vision is actually achievable, but someone acquiring the business is getting no benefit of the past. I mean, they only own the future. And so, you know, that's an exercise that I think just frankly, some some business owners and executives are just better at than others. And I think that the ones that are, they can, they can sort of get there. They can kind of see it. Right. You think that that's a good indicator, whether they should continue to operate the business or they should sell it. Right. If you're, if you don't have that vision, should you be, should you, would you be better off going to work for someone that does, <laughs> you know, like huh. completely off topic here of B2B commerce. But I think it's important to think about as like, some of these people maybe shouldn't be the founders for a certain period, right? Well, it's an interesting, we'll call it a, a canary in the coal mine, right? If you're, and we see this sometimes, it's like founders maybe, you know, they were super passionate, they grew it to a certain level, and now they're just either less passionate or kind of burning out or, hey, you know, I just, I just, you know what, I got it to this point, but maybe I'm not the right, you know, person or you know to take it to the next point that happens all the time which if you look at kind of the history of any large company and you go back in time and like see how it developed many of them developed that way i mean you know there were points in time where the company had kind of outgrown the leadership needed some different leadership and then that leadership took it to the next level and it repeats and repeats and repeats right so elon, elon musk didn't start tesla right that's what people forget yeah that. right yeah and and you know you don't even have to use anything big and famous for that because uh, you know and, and again my the listeners here know this that's part of what i do since i've since i've worked in e-commerce for a long time what happens is the founders will say this isn't for me what are we doing with the business? And either I come in and advise or I go in fractionally for a while 
and mm -hmm. do something and kind of figure out what we're up to with the business, right? But sometimes it doesn't work. And the the example that I gave uh, in, I actually gave this in a talk a while ago that was kind of funny to people, but I said, you know, how many kids in elementary school say they want to be an astronaut and they want to be, you know, a firefighter and they pick all these things that are really aspirational and amazing, but how many people actually can do that or actually going to put in the work to do it? And it's the same thing for startup founders. You could be passionate about something, but not be well suited to it, right? And just mm -hmm. really not sure that, you know, what you're going to do. It's the same as being an astronaut as a five-year-old, right? It's the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Well, and I think too, you know, um, the vision the vision stuff is is something where a lot of times you have different types of personalities some people are just operators and and they just like they're they're very very tight with running a very tight ship they're very efficient but but they're not the dreamers right they they're mm -hmm. not really the big the big picture people every great company hopefully has one of each they have a sure. great vision person and a great operator. There's a book, um, right? Isn't there like a book on that or something? Or yeah. there may be, yeah, yeah. There may be. Um, you should write it one. would make right? sense. <laughs> <laughs> I just throw that in, throw that on the list. Throw that um, in there. Yeah. That's right. But yeah, and I think that yeah, you know, when we talk specifically about this, you know, I think the other thing that is difficult, calling back our to our point about how fast things tend to move, I think that also kind of gives leadership some some pause sometimes because it feels like well wait a minute you know yeah we go through all this trouble and then you know six months from now when all this work is complete you know we're already you know our, our technology is already old now you know and so there that that's kind of used often as an excuse um i yeah. think to, to well, that's know, why i to think it's important it. to find you know that that right tech stack right a lot of what we do is uh -huh consulting on the tech stack. And I think, unfortunately, companies don't appreciate that enough. I wish they would kind of like, you know, pay a little more to us up front to do more of that to look at the whole tech mm -hmm. stack, because I think sometimes they just try and bolt things on. And, you know, I, I've seen some prospects where I'm like, man, this is it's so obvious to me, they need a re complete reboot of their whole tech stack. But I don't know. Yeah. I think it's maybe they just don't understand the value of it, or they just don't have the foresight to to hire someone to help them with it. Or, um, mm -hmm. but I think that there are enough good technologies out there that can bring you forward at least five, ten years. Like, you know, whether it's Shopify, Big Commerce, Adobe Commerce, you know, and you go through the selection, you make the right choice. These guys aren't going anywhere. Like, Shopify is not going anywhere. Big Commerce not going anywhere. I mean. There are some, I think, riskier players. So I usually advise against the ones unless you have a really good reason. But most mm -hmm. of the e-commerce tech stack is getting more mature, right? And it's, I think a lot of these players are going to continue to be around for a while, you know, and they're going to get better and innovate. And yeah, maybe they won't always be the best platform in 10 years. But I think that's an excuse. I, to your point, I think it's, it's, yeah. it's enough good technology out there. I think the one that can be tricky is the ERP. And the ERP is tricky because yeah. it's not as forward moving technology. And so like, you know, we've done a lot of work in the ERP space. And it seems like only a few are even really cloud native, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. <laughs> well, in the implementations, it, everybody's got a horror story about an ERP yeah. uh, implementation. That's the other thing. And I think yeah. like a lot of things, right? Over time, uh, it will get better. It will get easier. It'll pro, you know proliferate, and and I think that as that happens, this will naturally I think start to correct itself. But I think also as we were kind of talking about, there is no e-commerce really school out there, although that's starting to change. Is I think a lot of times I mean you know companies aren't really sure where to turn. Again, this this expertise it's not native, it's not anywhere inside the business, right? So they're not sure where to go get it. You know, guys like you um, are not a dime a dozen, right? It's not like the, the the countryside is just littered with all kinds of great resources. There's some, there's enough, I mean, to, to, to they're out there, but people oftentimes probably don't know where to go, right? To get to understand. Also, I think there's a lot of biases, Tim. I think we talked about platform selection in the in terms sure. of it, it, the software vendors are going to hard sell you and you know they're great at that because that's what they do and they're trying to get their commission and then a lot of the the vendors or the, the agencies 
they might also just be trying to sell that one solution, right? And so mm -hmm. they're out there talking to people, but I think that sometimes they don't know how to navigate these conversations and figure out what's in the, those people's interest versus what's in their interest, right? And they might get kind of sold on the wrong thing. Yeah. It's, it's well, I mean, I'll just add this because it's, again, it's a topic that comes up outside of this podcast with a lot of folks I work with. There are very few people who are clean, meaning like are, who's not getting paid by any of these big platforms or whatever. I mean, it would be very easy for me to say, okay, I'm going to make this side deal, but mm -hmm. I can't because I'm the guy who goes in and says I'm clean, right? I go right. in my first meeting and say, I'm not getting paid by these people. Microsoft's not paying me to say this for to get Dynamics 365, right? I mean, it's and you have to have somebody in the room who's yeah. like that. Otherwise, it's a crisis. What, you what's know? interesting is I find that's especially true on the ERP side. There's a few people out there. You can find them on LinkedIn that are ERP agnostic, mm -hmm. uh, and they'll help mm -hmm. you go through the full selection of all the options. But uh, I think a lot of people just go with the the vendors, and most of the vendors only do that one ERP. So then, right. <laughs> you're talking yeah it's somebody. it's the classic when when all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail type exactly. situation yep. right? yeah exactly. so, so jason we're coming close to the end of our podcast and so we want to tell people uh how to contact you and why they should contact you and all this kind of stuff like do people contact you if they want millions of dollars of funding or, or, <laughs> That's or, right. or if, 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 if you want to grow if you want to grow your business to a point where it's a very valuable strategic asset and then get millions of millions of funding or sales proceeds yes that's why you call it what's the size that people should be calling you at just so that you know they have an understanding of where yeah, um, we 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 primarily spend time in the kind of five to hundred million revenue range okay. top line. You know, I, I would say the majority majority kind of five to fifty. Yeah. So and yeah. founder owned. If they're in that five to hundred million range, um, and it's okay if they have some stores, some B two B, some B two C, as long oh, as yeah. they're kind of selling product and generally product based businesses, I assume. Um, more often than not, but again, we, we have a big deal right now where we're, we're actually in market with a, a big third party logistics business. So we, we mean, we, we do things in that same ecosystem, but I'd say about 80% of what we work on will be very product focused business. Okay. But it could be logistics that ships product or Correct. finances <laughs> product yeah. or has something to do. <laughs> it doesn't have to be the product itself. But that's, that's great right. to know. I mean, there's a ton of people out there and or they're and I assume uh, I'll throw this out to you. I'm sure if they're not at five million, you know, you still might want to talk to them if they're getting close. So they they need that advice to get there and get to get to you eventually. Absolutely. Well, because the other thing we just love to do, we just try to be good stewards and, and try to offer resources. So, yeah, we I talk to business owners all the time that you know, they're not a great fit for us, but they really need, you know, a resource that focuses on, you know, one particular skill set. And the good news is over the years, we've gotten in, you know, gotten good relationships with guys like yourselves and others that we consider really best in class at what they yeah. do. And we try to, we try to be, you know, just a big refer machine, man, help yeah. trying to connect people where we can. But like you said, there's not this almanac of these people, right? You kind of just have to build it up over time. Yeah, <laughs> you know? so, so, that's the way it works. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much. This was awesome. Sure. We'll have to have both you and Chris back. And I'm sure in a year from now, you guys will have some new B2B war stories for us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we could do a we could do many episodes just on war stories. So we we'll do we'll do a separate one on that. A failure, that might be a failure episode. I think it's a good learning lesson, right? Why not? Yeah, yeah, I've, got, I've got stories. We all got stories. That'd be great. All the stories we've all gone through. You know, we could each have our own piece, and we'll come around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I got some good right. ones. Yeah. And, and what did you and what did you learn from it? You know, it's been said a million times. You learn a lot more from your failures than you do your uh, successes, and it's true. It's not just a saying. It's very true. true. Don't be scared to fail. That's what we should. That should be the, the lesson of this podcast for B2B. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. Thank you again, guys, for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Jason. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm.